Hey everybody, it's Dr. Jensen with CCJ3701 Research Methods in Criminology. And I am here to show you the answer key for Lab 8. Now I'm not going to go for uh, a recoding video like I did in Lab 7 because I did a lot of examples and assistance with Lab 8, but I am going to go through the interpretation again so you can practice and get the hang of it. Some people struggled with trying to put the numbers they got from SPSS into plain English. So that's what we're going to work on in this video so you can get the hang of it and also get better at it if you're going to use this for your final paper. So remember in this exercise we were predicting arrest. Okay, the likelihood of getting arrested um, by knowing if someone's using drugs coming from a single parent family and what that person's gender is. Okay, so in the previous two videos that you used to do the lab, you constructed a drug use variable or a summation that used these 10 variables. And these variables ranged from cocaine usage to prescription drugs, heroin, uh, marijuana, methamphetamine, and so forth. Okay, so uh, we worked through that summation together and they were all coded the same as one yes, zero, no. And it's the same kind of scheme for all 10 of those variables. And once you actually built your summation variable, you should have gotten a frequency that looks like this. So zero drug use usage, one drug, two drugs, three drugs, four drugs, and so forth. So it's very natural to see this number tend to go down. Uh, by the time someone uses nine out of the 10 drugs, it's very few people. Someone, only eight people in the whole sample use 10 out of 10 drugs. Okay, um, so you would have gotten a variable that had that kind of a frequency to it. And then, what is the average number of drugs used? All you had to do was do a mean for that variable, and that mean was 1.625. So on average, people used one and a half, almost two drugs. And then what are the independent, dependent, and control variables? This is, again, something you would do to make sure you have everything straight before you jump into a regression. So our independent variable was drug usage. We want to see if they get arrested. And we also want to measure single parent and gender. So again, the first two variables that tend to get mentioned in a research project usually are the independent and dependent variables. And you just have to pick out the what happens or the outcome variable from the predictor variable. And then the other variables that are mentioned later tend to be controls. So now you know what everything is and you can run the regression, okay? You also had to work on the single parent versus married variable, and this shows the syntax of all the changes you would have had to make for that variable. So one is one, two is zero, and then three through five is one, and then dealing with your missing data properly. So this just shows some of how that should have come together. And then it asks, do you need to recode the gender variable? Yes, you do, okay? Do you need to recode the arrest variable? No, you don't. So remember the gender variable had one is male, two is female, and we actually changed that to one and zero. And then for the arrest variable, it was just a yes, no variable, and it was already yes is one, zero is no. So that one was fine, ready to go out of the box. We didn't need to change it. Now that you have all your variables ready, time for the analysis. So this is where you put everything into the equation, and this is the results part. The interpretation. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this so you get the hang of it. Here's the language we tend to use for interpreting binary logistic regression results. So you got um, exponential b's, you also got uh, significance levels, and you got an r squared. So remember at the bottom of the lab it said you have to think about this in terms of odds or the probability or likelihood of something occurring. So that kind of brought your attention to those odds ratios. You also have the Nagel-Kirke R squared. It's an approximation of the variance explained. It's similar to an R squared, right? Um, but it's not perfect, okay? So we treat it in a similar manner, but it's actually mathematically impossible to calculate R squared for this type of regression, but we come up with something that's close enough. So we call it an approximation. And then finally, it reminds you about how to treat your odds ratios. We use the exponential b column, okay, an exponent of the b coefficient or a logit of it. And it said if your odds ratio is greater than one, then your outcome's more likely. If it's exactly one, there is no difference. 
And if your outcome is, your odds ratio is less than one, your outcome is less likely. So the interpretation for logistic regression tends to be a little bit more straightforward and easier than linear. But uh, these were just little reminders saying you can say this in a variety of ways, depending on which group you're talking about. You're always making comparisons when it comes to those nominal variables. And then last but not least here at the bottom, odds ratios of nominal variables means the likelihood is more or less likely for the ones versus the zeros. Looking at odds ratios for interval variables, the likelihood is more or less likely for one unit increase in that variable. Okay, so uh, as this variable increases in quantity, the likelihood or odds of it happening um, is more or less likely. Okay, and then a reminder on how we look at significance levels as well. So writing it up in English, this is what a results section would look like. I determined that there is a positive relationship between drug usage and the chances of getting arrested. So first of all, you have a positive exponential B. You can say, this is a positive relationship. As people use more drugs, their chances of getting arrested increases. That's it. You found an answer to your question. But then you get to bring in the details of the statistics that SBSS analyzed for you. The exponential B or odds ratio indicates that with every additional drug a person uses, that they are 1.3 times more likely to get arrested. Or, again, we can look at that little 0.3. Anything over one is, is a higher percentage chance approximately a 30% higher chance of getting arrested compared to people that use fewer drugs. And again, we can tell the reader this relationship was highly statistically significant. It had those little triple zeros next to it on the end. So we can be very confident that beyond chance, this is actually a true relationship with very little room for error. 99.99999% chance of it being true. Then next, we can start talking about our other variables. So whenever you do results, you usually talk about the main result with the independent and dependent first. You talk about your odds ratios, your significance levels, and so forth. Then you move on to your next variables. Uh, single parent. People who experienced a single parent household during their youth compared to those with married parents are no more or less likely to experience arrest in their lifetime. It wasn't significant, as there is no statistically significant relationship. However, males, and this is when we move on to the last variable, males are 3.3 times more likely to experience rest. But let's go back up to the single parent variable. It's the same kind of a lesson that you learn in linear. Anytime you have a variable that is not significant, there really is no point in going into the details of all the other numbers you found out with it and about it because we can't rule out chance that it's actually true. So the only thing that's really useful that you can say to the reader is this is not a significant variable. These two variables are not related. Moving on, okay? There really is nothing more to say. And again, it is helpful to remind the reader of who any comparison groups are, just so they don't lose track. And that's usually who are your zero groups. Now on to this male variable. That was probably the most powerful variable in the equation. Males are 3.3 times more likely to experience arrest in their lifetime as compared to females. So they had a little exponential B of 3.3 something. That's a, incredible. So just being male, you're much more likely to be arrested than being a female. And it was a highly statistically significant relationship. So you could actually write out the words highly statistically significant, or you could put this little P value in parentheses indicating to the reader that it had a very low chance of being false, okay? So there's a lot of ways to say the same thing. You can say, this is highly sign significant. You can tell about the p-value. You can say there is a, a strong positive relationship. You can say lots of different things and they all kind of tell you the same thing. Usually we end a results section with the overall statistics and results that pertain to everything we were analyzing. And in this case, that's our pseudo R squared. Again, from the linear video, I talked about how R squared tells about how important the variables are in being able to predict the outcome, um, whereas these significance levels tell you whether or not they matter. Um, but in the scheme of things, does this really provide the best explanation of arrest? Maybe, maybe not. So we use the Nagel-Kirke value, and you'll notice in SPSS you're provided one called Cox and Snell, 
and one called Nagelkirky. The one that resembles R squared the way we interpret it the most is the Nagelkirky. There's a little bit different interpretation for the Cox and Snell, so we don't use that one as much, but it is there. And, there, and in fact, if you really care, there are 12 different versions of pseudo R squareds that different statisticians and mathematicians have created to try to assist people in using that statistic to make predictions. But we just remind the reader, it provides an approximation of the variance explained in chances of arrest. We got a 0 0.20, meaning that oh, about 20% of the chances of arrest can be explained by knowing these things about somebody. Knowing their gender, their single parent experiences, though it doesn't contribute much because it wasn't significant, and their drug usage patterns. So we get only about 20% coverage in trying to explain everything that could possibly predict whether you're going to get arrested or not. Um, but we get some decent coverage here. There are likely better predictors of arrest that can explain more. So again, how important are all these variables, knowing these things about somebody and being able to predict what happens to them? Eh, they're okay. They're, they're not bad. Um, and some are significant, some are not. But there are others that are probably more powerful that can certainly take us a little farther at being able to predict if they're going to get arrested. So again, when we do regression, we like to look at risk factors or protective factors and things that tend to have relationships so that we can count on them and use them to maybe do things like prevention or demonstrate that things are related, therefore we need to go after them, or that's the key to being able to um, make policy about it or try to make changes with it. So that's kind of all that is. But uh, essentially, that is how you would write up in plain English, all of your results from binary logistic regression. And you want to follow that kind of a format when you do your final paper. Just go one piece at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself. Take your time. Start with one variable, one odds ratio, or one coefficient. Write out what it means in English. Then talk about the significance level. And just kind of take it one piece at a time. Before you know it, you're going to have a few paragraphs of results that are going to tell the person exactly what happened in SPSS. You can also use your table to kind of guide the person through what happened. And in subsequent videos later, I tell you how to put all this stuff into a table to display in an article or a report or a paper so people can actually just read all of your statistics in one place. Okay, but again, don't get overwhelmed. You'll get more practice with this. I show you lots of examples. Results sections are highly technical. There's only so many ways to say things like statistically significant. That simply is the language we use. So they're not terribly sexy to write. They're very um, kind of dry and report worthy. Uh, you get a lot more creativity and expression when you talk about the discussion. So make sure when you write up results that you're not preparing little comments on what you found. You're really just reporting what happened. Uh, you don't want to unpack, discuss, or comment on what you found until the next section, which we're going to talk about writing soon as well, the discussion section. So this is just sharing what the statistical result was. Again, not terribly exciting or sexy, but it tell, t tells us what the results of your tests were and how your hypotheses did, did things work out the way you thought, what did you actually find, so forth. So hopefully you found this helpful. And uh, again, if you have questions, please reach out but you were able to kind of practice and review how to write up the results of logistic regression in less than 14 minutes. So um, good luck, and we'll see you again soon.